Okay, we're ready to go. Yep. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is the first annual, we hope, TIFF Summit between with educators of Canada and America talking about tech ideas, educational technology ideas. To start it off, we have Derek Tangretti and Derek is from is currently a mathematics and science technology instructor at Western University in London, Ontario. Uh, Derek has also received an award of excellence for his work at uh, Western University and uh, Thames Valley DSB around STEM education, computational thinking, and more. To connect with Derek, please make sure you go to uh, at D Tangred, T A N G R E D, and Twitter and uh, go to his website, hackededu.com, which will be on the website. So, Please feel free to uh, follow the website bit.ly slash TIFF Summit to get all the information and Derek's connection. So without further ado, I want to welcome you. My name is Andy Wheelock. Melanie Kitchen is also our event planner, and uh, we're going to open it up with Derek. Derek, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Andy, and thanks, Melanie. Um, hey, everyone. I am going to just start um, by using a Nearpon. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, but if you are not, um, can I, I'm just going to start a live lesson and you should see it on your screen. So if you in a browser window could go to nearpod.com and enter in this pin code D W A I M, you will be able to get it. And I actually think I can put the link directly into the chat here, just to make it easier for some, if I can um, pull it up. And run, here we go. Actually, I might stop sharing for one second, just to make sure. And then if you use that pin code, it should take you directly to um, the Nearpod. So I'll pull back up the Nearpod just so you can see. It's just nearpod.com. There's a little text box at the top, which will say enter your join code. And it's D-W-A-I-M. D-W-A-I-M. And while we're just waiting um, for that, um, I'm just going to say that this session is just more about uh, like an organic conversation. Um, I really just want to hear a lot of your thoughts as well. And I, you feel free to stop me at any time. Uh, I kind of love doing it that way. Um, so I'm just excited to hear what your thoughts are and interject at any time. I know um, either Andy or Melanie will stop me and I'm happy to answer any questions both during the session uh, as well as after the session as well. Um, so we'll see how many people we have in here. So I think we, oh, 11. So we got a lot already quick. So here's where you can find me. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit about learning constructed. Uh, and again, my name is Derek Tangredi. I'm at Tangred on Twitter. And I do have a bit.ly to these slides in case you want the actual slides afterwards, you can have them. Um, and I'll share out anything in addition to what I say um, if I go too fast or skip over a part. So uh, thanks for joining first off, this is awesome. And I'm trying to represent, I guess, Canada here to start things off. Um, so this should be fun. So just, as, just so we can start, I wanted to start off with a poll and just see how you're thinking. So if you take a look at your screen and I asked this to our moderators before the call, in all honesty, how is your learning experience going with online learning? Uh, and you might wear a couple different hats here. You might wear this as both a parent and as a teacher. So how is it going? So I put out like fantastic, best teaching ever, some good days, some bad, it's been challenging, I'm struggling. Um, and I'm just kind of curious to see what we get as a, as a collective answer here. And I'll just give like, I think there's a timer on it of like 45 seconds just to start, but. We'll see what people come up with. It's been so far, it's like it's been challenging and yeah, I'll give a few more chance to go in. Sorry, Andy, were you gonna say something? Or no? no. Um, okay, so it looks like so far for those people who answered, we're looking at like some good days, some bad. So, and then it's been challenging. So I'll share that out just so people can see quickly like a synopsis of what they're looking at. So honestly, when we were on this call, like talking about it before, this is what I've been seeing too. And I've really been faced with is some good days, some bad days, but definitely it's been challenging and more challenging than I initially anticipated. I think, and I think the big thing to know is like that that's okay. Um, and I'm going to lead back into that point, but like right now where I'm sitting, London, Ontario, Canada, so much endless excitement here. Um, I am a diehard Buffalo Bills fans for you guys out there, uh, as I was just saying before the call. So I don't know if that ends 
adds any favors for you out there sitting at home. But if you want to see a little bit more about London, Ontario, here is where I live. This is our literally our biggest strip and nice park in Victoria Park. And if you want, you can scroll around and see what all we, that London has to offer. But just so we're in this virtual world, we might as well embrace it and try to see what this uh, change looks like or could look like for a lot of our students as we take them beyond the walls of the classroom. So just thought it'd be kind of cool to show where I am. Um, so what about you? Like I. I know some of you got a brief bio about me, but I have no idea who you are and who, like what you teach. So if you don't mind just posting on the pad, that, like where you're from, what you teach, that would be awesome and greatly appreciated just so I can see um, and have a frame of reference of who we are. Drezik, yeah, I see you there. <laughs> um, and then anybody else who wants to just post where they're from, what they teach, any comments, questions, anything, uh, really just to get the ball rolling and then I'll start rolling into uh, some of the stuff that I wanted to talk about today. So for me again, London, Ontario, I do teach at Western University um, and I'll go over, the, oh, here we go, now we're all flowing in. Orchard Park, New York, fourth grade, all subjects. Fourth grade, oh, London District Catholic School Board, there we go. Um, eighth grade, Math and Innovation, Niagara, and Immediate Prep. Sorry, press the anchor too soon, Dress. <laughs> Uh, sixth grade math in New York. This is so cool because we'll have so many different perspectives. Oh, guidance. That's awesome. Uh, technology integrator at Erie, Seneca. I do stuff development for teachers around the area. Uh, Dad, North Collins, New York military tech, uh, pre K to six. And so Melanie was like, um, advising some of us, like from Canada, where ours is a little different. We traditionally have K to eight, um, and then we have nine to 12, but we know that you guys have middle schools and um, different elements and there's different qualifications around teachers in the area so i teach primarily within the k-8 to stream but more in the intermediate so that's like grade six to eight um and at the university level as well so we'll give another second just for people to fill those in and thanks for taking the time to do so that's greatly appreciated i have a better frame of reference of who i'm talking to now so quite a bit all over the board um, but definitely some consistency so where do I teach? Who the heck am I? So currently I teach at a school, Wilfrid Dre Public School, grade seven, eight um, in London, as I mentioned. Um, this is a very like high need school. It's a very transient school. It's very difficult. But I also teach at Western University as a researcher and instructor. I'm primarily within the STEM areas, so math, science, but then also empathy, because I don't think that any of these real learnings can be uncovered without having um, like empathetic design at the root of it. So what am i going to show today so last i think one of these interactives before we get into it so what is working for you right now during e-learning like what have you found successful uh, maybe that i've missed um what is one idea or something that is really working gamification awesome i wonder like what kind of gamification that is but like i know that it's a broad topic but i think that like just even thinking of my kids especially at wilford jury 7 8 that they would love that Bathroom breaks, Andy, Nearpod. I honestly, Nearpod, like I know I'm using it here and I promise I don't work for Nearpod, but I love Nearpod because my kids ask about it. Oh yeah, Minecraft EDU, Seesaw, uh, Zoom, Nearpod, Flipgrid, love all these options. Yeah, Padlet, I've been using Padlet a ton um, during e-learning, just to post your ideas, go back and share it out. Awesome ideas so far coming through. Um, and I'm glad that we have consistencies, OneNote, Awesome, yeah, like you can use like digital textbooks and things in OneNote, so many great choices. Um, give another like a couple seconds, Zoology. Okay, I haven't really used Zoology, so that's kind of a cool one from Julie. Thanks, Julie. Uh, interactive opportunities, Choice Board meets Kahoot. Oh, and who, Casey, setting this up beautifully. I love this. Mm -hmm. This is like the perfect plug right into where mm -hmm. we're gonna go. Um, oh yeah, you dress, yeah, I definitely uh, saw this too. Okay, so these are some great opportunities to talk about. Now we can like, even for someone sitting there, like who may not have heard of any of these or at least one or two of them. Now it's like, hey, maybe I can go and check that out and do that for like the last little bit with some of my kids or apply that in greater detail, maybe even next year, depending on what that looks like. So for me, when I started out, this was kind of the class uh, model. So I had students being bored because I was using the like, traditional model. So like I was adapting quick on the fly. And it was like this consumption model of me there and just throwing stuff out at them generally. So like, and this is what I just described kind of as like a consumption model, a passive model um, where everything is being consumed by them derived from me, which is not really my way. 
Um, so I kind of compared that to like, imagine learning and in, logging into Netflix and finding one movie and one show. Uh, you probably won't have too many subscribers and it's not going to go very well and people are going to drop the service over time. So what do we need? So I really love this approach by Queen's University of Medicine and how they really take a competency based approach. Um, and they're having like rave reviews from this. And it kind of uh, brought me to like the book of Douglas Rushkoff, Program or Be Program. And he talks about how kids today are so good at using YouTube and consuming YouTube, but they're a lot less good at creating content to put on YouTube. So we have to make this notion and shift from consumers to creators of content. So how do we do that? And I was just really thinking, trying to focus on adaptive models where we transfer more agency to the learner and judging by all the stuff that you guys have put in on the Padlet board, it shows that you are doing all the same things. So I'll skip some of that part. So I just put in a quote by Dewey, give people something to do, not something to learn. And this could not be more true of what I'm seeing in my class right now and what kids want. And kind of, to be honest, my classroom, I try to emulate some of the work from Mitch Resnick in Lifelong Kindergarten and moving the focus toward creation and away from grades. This isn't fully possible right now, but we're getting there. So it's all rooted in constructionism where learning is active and kids are designing in all these cyclical natures that support thinking constructs like design thinking and computational thinking. So what does that all look like? So here's some research just from Western about tools and how hands-on tactile tools um, are more like enjoyed and they have better learning outcomes, um, supported by research often. But the problem is how do we do that when we're not there in person? So that's really where some of my stuff comes in today. So how, as we, how do we as educators find our student purpose? So one, I'm glad that I saw this. It was perfect alignment and fit, choice boards. But the thing I noticed about choice boards, and I don't know if any of you noticed, so here's like a perfect choice board that was collaborated on by several members in uh, TBDSB in London, Ontario. Um, but the problem was when you get this, where does this workflow go? What I noticed that happens for me is our board uses Google. So I have 650 shared documents from the last week in my drive scattered everywhere. Um, I can't streamline it. I can't organize it. It's very difficult to follow. So the workflow is tough. So how can we make that a little better? So what I was trying to do, like, and I did this a while ago, was use interactive choice boards, but a couple of little differences that I tried to do with mine is in, like wherever you put your choice boards, like I add in a video tutorial and how you can be supported. But a big difference I found for my students with buy-in was having myself do the video tutorials a, because I know the students, B, they were, they were watching longer and uh, than they would if it was just a video I took off YouTube. But I also added a few other things. One was a submit button. Uh, and I'll show you how to do that so that all of the choice board work was submitted into one fixed location. So that if I needed to assess it, it was done so easily and it was streamlined. So no more messy drives. I don't have 45 different folders. Uh, that made a huge difference. So how do I do it? So here's just one example of like a choice board that I made. So I use a Google form with a link to submit. And all I do is insert a quick table. Um, and then I just select the size, like a three by three table. You could make this bigger. I change like the line weight and color just for aesthetic purposes, but nothing too fancy. And then I just add in the Google form. So. I have a tutorial video, which you will get in the slides if you request them of how to do this, along with just a summary, but I want to show how easy this can be done. So if I just go into like a, my Google account, I'm just going to quickly open up a Google form. So if I just open a Google form, what's going to happen is it's going to load and then this one will not look great, but I'm just going to call this um, like upload. Um, and then right now where there's the drop down of a multiple choice task, what you're just going to do is you are going to change this scroll down. So you see file upload. And once you see file upload, it'll ask you like something to continue, uh, just bypass that and continue. And what's really cool here is it allows you to specify the specific types of files that you want to receive from your students depending on what's within your choice board, um, they might share you a lot of different stuff, especially if it's a genius hour project, Minecraft I saw earlier, um, basically anything. So you click on this and you can accept PDF, video, audio, image, drawing, but maybe you don't want any presentation files, like you don't want slides for whatever reason, so you can leave that off. 
You can also accept a certain number of file files and you can change the size of which you're going to accept. So for example, you want one gigabyte uh, files to be accepted, no problem. You, change, you make this a required option and then you just copy the link and you insert it into the middle of your um, choice board. So hopefully, oh, sorry, go ahead. Derek, um, just a quick question. So the, on the choice board, there's a submission link to the form? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the great so great question. So you're right. So Melanie here, how about I show that? So let's say I wanted to send this to people. Like how would I do this? So maybe I'll we'll do it real quick as a as just so people can see. So if I hit send here, um I would just go to where it says link and I'm going to shorten the link and I'm going to copy this link. So just so people can see what this would look like. So I've copied my link. If I went into Google Drive, let's just say I wanted to do a basic Google Doc for just a second. So I'm just going to put this in a Google Doc form. So I'll make a quick chart. So I'll go to insert. I'll scroll down to table. And just as I said, I'll make a three by three table. So when I do that, and I could like enter these to make them bigger spaces. And normally I would make it like more aesthetically pleasing. But for now, I could just hit submit here, like, and then copy and paste the link. And now what all they have to do, and I could change the text of this, all they have to do is click on this link. And as a user, they will be directed to this. And now here's what they'll see. Like normally I'd put in instructions and they would just add file to attach. So you as the teacher now have all this student work and projects in one spot. And it doesn't have to be the same project. They can use their interest and things that they're passionate about and submit it and you have it, whether it be video, audio, Minecraft things like screenshots from coding, scratch, um, whatever it may be, Padlets, anything. Um, you can put them all into your Google form and have them in your own organized folder where you don't have to go through a shared drive and search for them. Um, and I just noticed that was really tedious, time consuming where I didn't have the time to do that. Um, and it just wasn't organized for me and it was kind of driving me crazy. So um, maybe that's useful to some of you. Um, I hope so. And I think I will have some questions about that, but I know I do this quickly uh, just because I know I have some other things I want to get to as well and we have limited time. But I do have these within my slide deck, a tutorial video on how to do this a lot slower, um, just so you can follow the step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that, if that's useful to you and it's something you wanna try. Now, the one other thing that I, like when I talked about earlier, like lifelong kindergarten, I think one of the big discussions is how do we shift from compliance of school to play? Like how do we foster that connection? Well, the biggest thing that I've noticed to be game-changing within these choice boards or something I just call like a mystery box, which is where I say like, students, you surprise me on with what you wanna put in here. And this is even like during school, but I've had students create the most profound things while they are actually using the mystery box items because it's something they came to me. It was a personal passion of theirs. And even some of my most reluctant learners, the best things I've got have always been from this. Like, I'm not kidding. So here's just a couple examples. One, I had a girl um, who was a little reluctant, like at math, but she wanted to do stop motion um, photography to prove uh, the Pythagorean theorem and different angular measurements with her body in front of the class. To this day, it is one of the craziest, coolest things I have ever seen because she's like a professional dancer. And it really shifted like her mindset and outlook on math and school just from doing this one thing. like. Um, I wish I could have her here to advocate for it, or just like you could even hear it, but it really changed just the way that she looked at courses and that she had some like choice and voice in what she wanted to learn. And that's not the only case. Like we've had um, people make, like here's another couple of cases to prove Pythagorean theorem, making tactile learning experiences where they're shaping the learning. Now there's another one in here where someone actually wanted to build like a rocket launcher and they actually like shot like a gas chambered carbon monoxide thing out on the yard and we had to get safety protocols to prove this. People were using sports, all sorts of crazy stuff, but just from offering a choice, um, nothing that I did just by putting it in, um, which was really cool. And this is where some of that choice board um, and file application would be really handy. Um, so just now there's just a quick chance for you. I've been talking a lot. Is there any questions pertaining to this portion that I may not have covered? I know that's a lot of info to take in quickly, um, but is there any questions that I may have that you may have that are just popping in your head or something that maybe I can better address um, just while we have a minute just to go through? And if you don't, that's okay. But if anyone has a question, I'm happy to answer. 
Um, now, or if there's any in the chat that I'm not seeing, friend uh, Mel and Andy can let me know if anything's up there. Or are we are we okay? I love the idea of adding a submission link on the choice board. No questions so far. Awesome, and thanks, Art. Thanks for uh, sharing. Yeah. Hey, Derek. Somebody put in um, boom cards, maybe yeah. as a suggestion or. Boom cards. Yeah, boom cards are really cool as well. And correct me if I'm wrong. So I checked out boom cards. I don't really use them a ton. Um, but my friends in like primary, so for us, that's more like one to three. Um, they said that they work really well in there. Um, any, is that correct, would you say, or could it be adopted beyond that? I've seen a lot of stuff on boom cards, but I haven't really been using them a lot. So, but that seems like a great option. No questions. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to go because it doesn't seem like a lot of questions. So we'll move on to the next thing. Okay, so one of the other things that I noticed is how do we make um, experiences more interactive, like how we're kind of doing now, even like I love Nearpod and I'm glad that a lot of other people do because it automatically does that. But some people like, especially at a school board level or a systems level, we can't do that. So why is this important? I just noticed a couple of things like students were coming bored. If you just post it on like um, either a OneNote or Google Classroom or you're sending like them a ton of different hyperlinks, but they don't know how to use the tools. They're not consistent. Things change. Um, parents get frustrated. I've seen that element if you're just sending them to a lot of different applications. So I wanted to like make something consistent platform so it'd be easier to use um, and like a standard approach. Um, and that so students are really active and a part of the lesson. So here just as a quick little like activity for you to do. So I gave you a little picture prompt in Nearpod and this will kind of like just hopefully like emulate what I'm trying to do. But these are like the two choices I feel students really have sometimes is A, like I just want you to draw which one of these you would rather learn, like the way in which you'd rather learn. So if you circle side A, you're just typing in your answers in order of these fractions. If you're circling B, you would be moving the fractions and manipulatives and representing them on a number line to prove what you're doing. So just a quick circle, you don't actually have to solve it. All you have to really do is circle, which one would you learn or draw, add in a reason why, which way would you rather learn? What would be the way? And I think, yeah, and some people might change too and do different ways. So, okay, and I'm seeing so a lot of people are going, yeah, and I've seen the smiley face, I like it. The smiley face on the right, um, and I know that some people are going to be really analytical too, and some people would want to just do like the straight abstract model of just plugging in the computation and that's fine. But what I'm finding with a lot of my students, they want to use like the virtual manipulatives. They want to be able to create and move something rather than just typing in answers. They want to be learning. And the research that I was kind of showing and alluding to earlier was that when they're in control of the content and manipulating it, they're going to have maybe greater understanding. And I don't just mean arriving at a summation or an answer. They're gonna have better understanding of why that answer is and have maybe greater math flexibility in terms of numbers. Um, now, one of the other ways and things that I did, and I might have to shift off here for a second is I made something like a PWIM. So I make interactive slides for students to use. So we did a shared reading. All I did at first was post like this picture. And I just said, like, what words do you see? Write them in the text boxes below. But the below words, like, really like the next slide. So students are coming up, they're writing their words, and then they're, sorry, they're taking their words, and then they're categorizing them based on what category they actually fall within in this text box. And this is just a literacy idea. This is by no means the fanciest idea of what you can do. And I'll show like this in a second. And then students, based on what they found, are writing like descriptive paragraphs based on what they did in their picture induction models. So here's like one of my student examples quickly. Um, and we're a very high like ESL population in my school as well. So finding picture induction models that are interactive where they can click words and drag them into the proper category. So they're sorting them made a bigger difference than me just saying like type a couple of words and type a story. And I'll show more of like what that means in just a second. So I also did this in math. So here's like an interactive slide. So rather than just giving them a math question, I wanted to add versatility and I'll, I might go just to my, um, my slide deck just so I can show you kind of what I mean. So when I go to my slide deck, so this would be the problem that they would actually be faced with. So use the cards, place them in the table to represent the graph on the left-hand side. So rather than students just writing out like formulae and whatnot, I actually have them interpreting the graph 
they click and drag their slides. So they post this, they've learned how to like make a copy and students complete this and submit this as more of an assignment. So it also takes away for me, it kind of is a differentiating factor for some of my kids who don't have the same writing capabilities or the same funds of knowledge, especially with the language, but can still prove to me that they understand some of the content that they're looking for. And they really were receptive to these. They love the interactive nature. So one of the other things that come up, so here's just like a second example, is like, please classify the triangle. And they would like move like their different like triangular measurements wherever they think they go. They would specify the type of triangle and they would fill them in, share them in. So I'm just more making interactive learning experiences for them. But the big ones have come in the form of concrete materials. So let's say you wanted to show like what you did in the classroom, it's previously like not possible using a consistent platform where you don't have to maybe send them to a hyperlink, but everything is made by you with the proper like curriculum that you're trying to get is using something like even as simple as this, like using a 10 frame and like trying to represent the math that you want your students to know, like using 10 frames. So this is just like a quick little like show of how you can do some of these. Now, a couple of things to know when you are designing these things. Uh, this one, to be honest, is not perfect because I can click and move this all over the place. So imagine a student gets this, makes a copy, and they start like moving this all over. That's gonna be messy for you and you're gonna get annoyed, especially if they change like your copy or they send it back and it's all over the place. So my, what I wanted to kind of show is how do you do this without having um, them be able to control everything? so that you're only making an interactive slide where they can only control a fixed amount of stuff. So I said, how do you build? So one, you want to design a slide for your students that you want them to complete. So use like a separate presentation, just open up a slide. Uh, do, do not include anything that you wanna be interactive at first, just include all the basics in design. Uh, download the file, so you would go to file, and I'll show this in a minute, file, download, and you can either save it as a PDF a JPEG or a PNG, and you will use that as your background on a later slide later on. Uh, so you're gonna upload that as your background and then add text boxes for interactive features. So here's one I quickly made um, like today, like just showing you like how simple this can be. So I'll show you like all the basic steps that I did just to get this started. So all I did was I said, please move all of the locations to their precise location on a map. So I took a map, I just added a um, background and I just put in a task. So once I have this as I wanted, all I did originally is I just did my file. I down, I um, did went to download and I downloaded as a PNG. And then I would just save that and then I would upload it later on. So what I did is I uploaded it as my background because when you do that, now notice this i can't move any of these items like i can on the first page so see how students could drag this and like move this all over the place you want to get away from that so they don't wreck your whole slide or have issues clicking now on the second slide it's just my background i just go to insert or uh, sorry i click on here background and i upload the image that i want and you just i saved it in my background but it's already done and then all i do to make this interactive is I go and I just add whatever things I want to make it interactive. So I could add another shape. So I click and add a shape. And this could be anything. Like this is not like the best example. It's just one example. So I could make this a number. This could be for stories. If you're a music teacher, you could do music notes. Um, you could do this anywhere. And I just put spots like around the world. So let's just say I wanted them to find Buffalo and I could change the border weight and things like that. Now they have this option and they can move it to wherever they believe that it goes. And now they won't ruin the rest of their assessment. So I hope that kind of makes sense. The kids that I've been working with, like, love these. We did like a Carmen San Diego theme, um, tons of different things that you can go on, but I don't want to make it too um, ambitious right now. I think this gets like the main elements across uh, that some of the things that can be done. Um, so there's a couple examples. Um, and I just shared like that one. Now, a couple of other tips that I just found useful for making these, just in our board right now is having a ton of issues with um, privacy issues, with using images um, that don't belong to them. Like it's getting really messy. 
So what we actually, I just put in some free websites that I'm sure a lot of you know, like Pixabay and Pexels are free, high resolution, high definition images that you can use because they belong to Creative Commons. And Clip Safari is another great one, especially if you're a primary teacher, um, like Kaya, just because they have some really great clip art that you can put into anything and are free to use. And it's, it's like such a minor thing, but it actually makes a huge difference. And then one of my favorite extensions, and oddly enough, I had to switch computers, so I don't have it on here, but is web paint. And I don't know if any of you are using web paint right now, but if you are, it is amazing. So like, let me paint this scenario for you. So you're, you're online, your students act like you're doing like a math lesson or whatever it may be. And your students ask you a question and they're just like, oh, I don't understand how you got blank. And now with web paint, what I can actually do. And so maybe if I, uh, I wonder if it'll still work if I do it. No, it won't work on here. Um, so that's not what I want. Um, so what I would do is I would click this and I can actually annotate my images on screen live. So if I need to do something with them, I can actually take it, document it, and I can take a screenshot and I can mail it to like email it to like admin if it needs to be for assessment, for a parent for clarification, do this as number talks, DRA assessments, whatever it is without affecting the document that's on the screen. Um, you can take screenshots, send them out. It's honestly amazing. It's color coded. It's free. Um, such a great tool. So handy to annotate uh, text or anything you're doing on the internet, slides, PowerPoint, whatever it may be. It's awesome. Uh, and then you have a working track record of it and just disappears uh, with no time. So that is a really a great one that I love. Um, okay. So just in terms of like interactive slides and creations, how do you think you could use that within your school, like uh, your class, your grade? And I also put in, if you're not sure, maybe like any ideas, comments, questions that maybe that that could be useful or how you would use it differently. Um, those are just a few examples. I didn't really wanna just stress on like, hey, here's this one portion of things. You can use it really in any subject matter and we've been using it a lot. Um, but just trying to see your thoughts. Um, do you think it'd be useful? Um, how could you use it? How would you use it? Um, anything that you have to share would be awesome. Quick question, Derek. Uh, actually, two. Um, the website for the pictures, that was Creative Commons, right? Yes, they're all Creative Commons. Okay. And then you are going to share this presentation, correct? Yes, 100%. So I'll even put up the bit.ly on the end and I can even put the link in the chat um, after like just before we get off because I think I'll have some time for questions um, and that will work. Um, so how do you give students feedback when they've completed interactive slides? Great question. So one is I actually have them do a lot of self-assessment before they hand in slides and projects and I'm going to show that next. Great question, um, but also beyond that, I like so when it's all submitted into like let's just say I had um, one of those slides as an assignment, like either in um, OneNote or Google Classroom, I comment directly on each of those slides and give them feedback. And then what I'll do is I'll take a screenshot or make a copy of their work and add comments directly on it, like adding a speech bubble or like a note on Google Classroom. It's um, it's been pretty, it's been pretty great. Like I, I love it. So I'm just trying to read these other questions as well. Do you allow students to collaborate together on tasks? Yes. I did this one, uh, if I have time to show you, I will, where each student took a, um, a UN sustainability goal and it was a collaborative slide deck and it was awesome. Each one, or like I had a couple people who had to do on um, each of their own, but I gave them the success criteria, what it looks like. And it just had the icon of each goal um, all the way down and they wrote their names in the bottom. And what I noticed by doing that, we went over like different aesthetic tips and they had to write like a sentence of how they're going to change the world. That was a really powerful project for them. And we printed them using Creative Commons. Like they went to Pixel Bay, took great photos. Um, we printed them in high resolution, high depth. They were amazing. I'll share you that project if you want afterwards. I have the whole thing with the success criteria and assessment. Um, and I can show you the picture samples that they made also. Um, is web paint like Cam? Yes, kind of. Um, maybe slightly different, but um, definitely. How do you share success criteria? Yes, all right, great question. So I put normally at the beginning of my slide or my lesson, what the success criteria is, and then I embed it into like a single point rubric or something I'm gonna show next called the bar model. And this is like the perfect alignment to what we're gonna do. 
I'd be curious to see how others might work to add audio. And yes, Drez, great, great comment. Yeah, the audio feature is really cool. So, and I'm sure Drez might touch on this. I don't know if this is, but I've seen a lot of people do like number talks in their slide where either they get their students to add their own audio and insert it, or you get the teacher to do it as like, say I posted a Google slide presentation. I wanted to show them how to multiply and divide fractions. So I'm doing it and showing it through interactive slides and I'm recording an audio or telling them what to do. Great point, Drez. It's giving me a couple ideas just even as I sit here. Uh, absolutely, we had two grade twos do this Google drawing to drag foods, love it. And map, oh, map of Ontario. That is amazing one, I love that. Oh, that's such a good idea. Uh, the moat extension, that looks really neat for that type of feedback. Yeah, so there's some really good ones. You guys are sharing some awesome ideas, so thank you for that. Um, so a lot of the questions that I just saw coming up were around assessment, like do you use success criteria? If you do, what does that look like? So normally in my presentations, and I can share them, is at the very beginning, like I will give them success criteria. And then I'm sure a lot of you have seen like um, a single point rubric. So like what's above target and what's below target. And what I really do is I put my success criteria right in the middle of both of these that I put at the beginning of the lesson. But not only that, I also want them to use the triangulation of assessment even during e-learning so that they can have like a tracking because like, how are they getting better? How do they know? Like, where do they go from here? So what we do is we take this and I have to give credit to um, one of my fellow teachers. So uh, on Twitter, Ash Neth, um, who's at my school, she introduced me to like this model and I have to say, it's pretty awesome. So imagine you're a single point rubric, but just tipping it over. And we call this the bar model. So what the bar model is, we take our success criteria that was in the middle and we start with very like easy achievable items and like student uses correct materials to build a hydraulic system. And they get progressively harder as we move from left to right. So here's all the success criteria I did on like a system build project. And what students do is they actually go and they either highlight or check off if they are exceeding the success criteria or like meeting it or if they are below the bar and they're not doing it. And what I really noticed with this, whether it be writing, like um, for us, like French speaking, math, this was a good way to see like, oh, I actually get, I actually am a level three because I'm not actually overextending um, between what Mr. T wants for all of these. I'm only doing it on like three out of five. Um, and this was honestly amazing, like keeping this in your writing journals or like even attaching it to a Google doc, whatever it may be, students do this before handing in their work. And sometimes I'll say, okay, did you refer back to success criteria? And they know automatically now. Here's a slide presentation, second slide, learning goal success criteria. Last slide or near the back is self-assessment with the bar and they have to complete all of that with me. So like, and submit it. If they, if they don't, I'm gonna ask them, I'm gonna hand it back to them and be like, well, you know at least now why you are a 65% student or 75 in terms of assessment, but you will see that like this gave them a growth opportunity to actually grow and learn something new. Um, honestly, this was like a game changer in a lot of ways for a lot of different types of assessment. And it's so easy. You can actually too, a lot of teachers print this off and make big copies and hang it on their wall in the classroom. Um, so I know we're not in the classroom right now, but you can do that on a virtual classroom. Um, but if you, when we do go back eventually, you could actually put these out and have students actually take their work tactilely and hold it up and compare it with reference points to success criteria. So you could use benchmarks to see what, where they are and if it's uh, meeting expectation or not. So I hope that kind of meets some of the success criteria and assessment uh, questions, but I just thought it was really great to share. You can cut these things out, print them off, and just put them in their notebook and then even add comments on it. And it's a direct link to all your success criteria messaging throughout the year. Um, and I just really just put it in because again, triangulation of assessment, really trying to focus on like not just the products, but observations and conversations with the students. Like, and I found that that was coming out more with some of these things. Um, and here's just different levels of how I'm trying to achieve that, like during online learning conferencing, like doing some one on one calls on like Google meets and whatever it may be teams, um, video documentations, uh, a lot of you like Drez talked about the audio feedback and like giving audio feedback to some is really handy. Um, especially with like now like Google with Google, the closed captions for my school that's big so usually when I'm doing lessons I put on closed captions. Um, interviews choice boards, you name it, uh, but these are the things that we are really looking to do and I know it says Ontario because this is outlined in. Um, our documents of what we need to actually do, but just so it's there. 
Um, I also am doing a lot of Edpuzzles. I'm sure a lot of you know Edpuzzle, but if you don't, um, Edpuzzles are awesome. Uh, you make your own video. Well, you can use uploaded videos already, but I noticed when I was doing them, um, it wasn't working unless I made my own videos. And I made my own videos in math, and you can add multiple choice questions, notes, or open-ended questions, and link them to like Google Classroom or whatever you need to as an assessment piece. So you can walk through tutorials. And most recently, students have been doing them to me and quizzing me with it, which is super cool. Um, so they've kind of taken the reins uh, over on that one. But just another cool little site that I've had success with um, and really enjoyed, and students really like it. So I know, I actually can't believe I made through all those with uh, the time. So um, we have five minutes left, but here's a chance for you. I said, thanks, like, first off, thanks so much for joining. Like, I honestly, I truly value your time. I know how busy, like, all of you are, um, and I so appreciate it. Um, and thank you for listening and sharing your amazing ideas. But if there's anything I can help with here, um, please let me know. Um, and that's what I'm here for. If there's any resource you want, or if I can help you in any way, or you have an idea, or just a comment, anything is, would be greatly appreciated. But uh, uh, no worries, guys. Any time for you, buddy. Uh, thank you for sharing. All these are great. Um, keep going. Yeah, with, if anyone has ideas um, or just even random questions you want to throw out there, I'm here. Uh, happy to listen and yeah, really excited and grateful for your time. Uh, thank you. Is Nearpod, can you share an example of the bar method? I'm bit, yeah, confused. Yeah, sure. While you guys are doing that, let me, um, here I have, um, let me see if I have something. What can I pull up that I had from recently here? Let me, I wonder if I, what did I have recently that I used with it? Because I've had a lot of stuff in here. Um, I'm just trying to think of one that I had. Um, right away. Um, I can share one. I might have to send it after. I'm trying to think of a good one that um, will show you. I have like a narrative writing single point rubric, but I don't know if I have a bar one in that. I have to go I have to go through, but I do I wonder if hold on my UN slot will be mine. I forget what I called it. Uh, I know it's no no no. Is it in here? It might be in one of these. Hold on. Let me see if it's in this. Some of these are shared and made copies. Uh, so I'm going to see. Okay, this is a different one. This is like a very basic one, but I do have one here. So we were doing a PSA. And so I gave them like, um, I think it's from a previous day with a supply, but like I give them their learning goal and success criteria. And I take these learning goals and success criteria, and all they do now is take the same success criteria. And so like, here's a thing, set a purpose. So now all I do is make a three by however many grid, so a four by three grid, and, or sorry, four by four grid, and the PSA has a clear defined purpose. So let's say the student achieved it. They themselves would either highlight or say, like do a check mark in here, or they could even just use a color fill. So like, let's say green. Like they can even put in, yes, the, P the PSA exhibits personal style. Yes, like they did it. But then say like, oh, it did not contain aesthetic value. They would mark themselves below like expectation. No, they rushed it. It only took five minutes. They didn't do the greatest job with it. And then they would actually submit that with their work. And even when we're hanging things on the walls, like if I can find my sustainability ones, I'll share that. And you'll see that with like, well, everything is up there. It doesn't have their names on it, but like I know it says on the back and you can actually check off and read their own self-assessment with their work that is in the classroom on the walls so that they know that that's with the expectation. Uh, sorry, I'll go back to the Nearpod so people can see because I didn't see them all. Uh, thank you. Is Nearpod easy to use with grade four? Honestly, Nearpod is so easy to use. Like what's great about it for to me is you can take your existing slides push them in the Nearpod and just make them more engaging and interactive. It just adds to what you're already doing. I kind of think of it like the SAMR model and trying to strive to that redefinition. So say you had a lesson on, um, and I don't like, I don't know, um, natural disasters, just as an example, and you wanted to like take them to show them one, you can use the free virtual reality field trips 
and take them somewhere that's experienced that and they can see like firsthand the aftermath and kind of walk around with it then you can create polls and like matching games it just it's kind of like a break where it's more of them and less of us and like that see more puppet let less us more them um and transferring more agency to the learner if that makes sense uh that's really what i've noticed for it um by the way love the bills thing you may address let's see this one uh thank you for sharing i love these great ideas looking forward to sharing these with educators awesome thanks casey um thank you so much for taking the time oh this is awesome no and yeah anything that you guys need I, there's so much here and i want to share um more um but i just don't even uh, know but uh yeah if anyone needs anything else andy thank you uh if anyone needs anything else uh like i'm still here and any other questions i will try to find i do really have to find um what these goals are this is like for one just one quick example of one of the UN project, like the collaborative goals that someone asked earlier. So I just set them up and these are all in the corner. They kind of changed them. And the, each one of these goals became pretty strong. And these are all like student drive. And when they're printed, a lot of these look like a mate, like they learned so much from this. Like what is like um, rights of using photos and creative commons? Like, what does that look like? And for some of these, they, they have like emigrated from Syria and have like little to like no English. So some of these look like professional. When they were on the wall, our admin was like, where did you buy these? Um, and they look really strong and they took great content and they loved this project. And I noticed they were kind of assessing from one another, which was so cool. Um, and these are just a couple of the ones you can see just different amounts of them coming in um, and just like doing like, just honestly an incredible job for some of these things. So I was really, really blown away. If you want this lesson of what this looks like, I can share it. I think it might even be posted on my website, but I'm not sure, uh, but I'll share anything that you guys want if there's anything I can help with. But yeah, and I'll stop sharing just in case uh, I'm talking enough. Um, and, and yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, any other things that I can help with? Or no, are you going to say something? Um, I see somebody has their hand raised. Bobby, I'm going to unmute you. I see your hand raised. Do you have a question? I'm OK. I hit the wrong button. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's OK. That's OK. I just want to make sure. Um, if anyone else has a question that you would prefer to speak rather than type, uh, now's your chance. I'll unmute you. Um, you can raise your hand, which I think should be toward the bottom of your screen. There's a little um, speaker phone kind of thing. Oh, look, there's something that says too fast, shared way too much awesome stuff. <laughs> <Sit down. laughs> Kyle, I got the Kyle song. Kitchen, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I spell favorite with a U as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's awesome, and I'm just and sorry, like I awesome that Kyle's in here too, and I'm just uh, I do see a question from Natasha, like about Nearpod, similar to Peer Deck. I would say that it's very it is similar, and that comparison gets brought up a lot. Just a personal preference for me, I like Nearpod because they have so many integration points with different things and they really take feedback. So like they have embedded like Flipgrid now, like class trips, uh, Padlet, like it, it doesn't stop. And like even the FET systems for science and physics teachers. So like for me, there's just even more differentiation. So it's just been awesome. They're super supportive by like educators first. And that means just a lot to me in terms of research. So I love it. And there's free models out there that you can use. And honestly, the biggest thing for me of why I love it is students ask for it more. Like even online, I had a student the other day asking like, Mr. T, can you make me a Nearpod to help out with this one like patterning assignment? Like I'm not understanding certain parts. And she literally said like, can you make me a Nearpod? Like not a slide presentation. Like that's the format that she wanted. And um, they're like, they do awesome with it and they love it. They can't get enough, like all the different features. And I didn't even touch on half of what you can do there um, with a lot of that stuff. I just wanted to give you something to maybe like inspire you and let you do something um, like you guys, know, you guys are super creative and have some better ideas than I do, and so you can apply them. And I would love just to see what you make. It'd be awesome. Any other questions? Eric, you're using the paid version of Nearpod, correct? I do have the paid version of Nearpod. The free version does allow you to run like everything that you would need like in your classroom, but there is additional things that you can do with the paid version. Now, with that being said, for those of you who are interested in using it, you can actually become like a Nearpod certified teacher for free by creating a lesson and emailing it to them. 
and they will upgrade you to a paid version, even just for, I think, several months to try it out if it's something that you're interested in. And then you get like all the benefits of using your pod and the platform. And now they even have like Google Slides um, extension. So if you make something in slides, you can just actually use the extension and convert it to Nearpod within slides. You don't even have to go there. Um, it's awesome. But yeah, anything else? Any other questions, things you need? I'm here. Um, I have a couple things coming up, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if people are pressing the right buttons or. <laughs> <laughs> you can type in the chat. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Whatever, uh, whatever works here, and I'll, I'll do it. And like, I mean, I'm on Twitter too. They can send me uh, the DMs or emails, whatever it, whatever it may be. Oh no, all right. Thank you. No, that's uh, really kind. I'm honestly happy to help. And the, with the people you're presenting here and organizing are amazing. So. Um, you guys are in for a treat. Like I humbled to be within uh, this group for sure. All right. <laughs> oh, you warned me. <laughs> I had over here. All right. <laughs> it's a good thing we're recording this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I guess if there's not anything else, Andy, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, were we planning on a break before we start with? Yeah, why don't we Mike? stretch a little bit and get Mike set up and that'll give everyone okay. a chance to run and grab a drink of water or whatever you like. Okay, so Derek, um, if you wanna put your contact info maybe in the chat or anything else, um, everyone will have that. I put his presentation link in the, uh, the site, the website. Okay, oh, great. Right, right, right. Amazing. Okay, so meet back here at two o'clock, Andy. Yes, two o'clock. Two o'clock? Uh, okay. Uh, All right, we'll all take right. a quick break and we'll be back together at two. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Derek. No problem. Happy to help. Uh, oh, sorry, I saw another question. Do students need to log in with Nearpod? They need to just log in. They don't need a student login or anything. They just, like, just how you did with the PIN, that's one of the greatest features. They don't need to sign up, do anything. They just, you activate the lesson and they just sign in. So you'll activate a PIN every time. It's like a five digit PIN. They just go to the website, log on, and there's also a free app download as well. So both on Android and Google Store, you can just go and down, like, download the app. You could do it from your phone and iPad and, it pushes to all their like devices in the class and they can partner, whatever, whatever works. Okay, awesome. Uh, okay, enjoy your break, guys. All right, <laughs> thanks, Derek. <laughs> Mike, are you with us? Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, okay. How's it? I'm my audio. I I went outside of my house because the kids are on the inside. This is like I'm on the patio. It's like a quiet space, but every once in a while, like a breeze kicks up, and I was just curious how the sound is from my end. Because if the it sound is right good, now, it sounds pretty good. Okay, as long as the sound is good, I'm all right. If I have to move, I'll uh, pick up and move. So, okay. As long as you know, like the neighbor doesn't show up and have his like lawn cutting service. <laughs> you know, they're like lawn <laughs> mower in there. In the background. Not that that would happen, you know, right during presentation. Never. But yeah, I can hear hear some birds singing, but that's uh, nice. I'll let them let them go. So are you good with sharing?